came down from the Toledo area today, and um, uh, man, traffic on 75 is something. Um, and there was, uh, I think, an unfortunate accident um, for someone uh, that stopped all traffic for quite a long time, but I'm glad to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I am a, uh, I, I was a seminary faculty uh, professor. Um, my um, title was Assistant Professor, professor of the History of Christianity uh, and Religious Studies, Director of the Master of Arts Theological Studies Program. Um, and I'm going to talk about why I left that position today um, and the sort of consequences that can come from some of that a bit, uh, one of those being, uh, you know, a paycheck. Uh, that's kind of important. Um, so today I want to talk about that, but part of it is based on what you're seeing in this title, which is how curiosity you know, killed a seminary faculty position. And uh, so uh, you've heard curiosity killed the cat. Uh, cat. <laughs> um, and this is uh, going to cover, like I'm just going to talk about a little bit about my background and stuff as we go along, but just a, sort of a short way of doing it. I was raised a pastor's kid. Uh, I was in an evangelical, fundamental evangelical home. And um, uh, it was one of those homes where uh, the, you, you're thoroughly involved in church. Almost every day of the week, somehow, you end up at church. Bible studies, you know, moving chairs and tables for events, these kinds of things. Uh, from the age of four on, I'd been uh, in the church. And um, my father is still pastor uh, today, uh, a small church called the Assembly of Christians, which is uh, just uh, in Michigan. And uh, that particular life, being raised as a pastor kid, I'll talk about that a little bit, but how many, is anybody here uh, a PK, former PK? Okay, uh, any missionaries kids? It's very similar. You rebel pretty much the same way. Um, and I was a student at, I went to three evangelical schools. So uh, I was raised in the church, three evangelical schools, um, and uh, I became a seminary professor. It's almost like that's where I was heading. <laughs> so when you're a, uh, raised in the church, there's only a few, if you're a good kid in the church, there's only a few options. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but first I want to talk about what curiosity is. Um, curiosity is our inherent human drive to close the gaps in our knowledge, to know ourselves, and to explain the universe around us. Now this is a, a somewhat broad definition, but um, it is one in which a lot of individuals over the last 2,000 years have wrestled with the definition of curiosity and have actually paired it often with words like wonder. And for a long time, curiosity was seen as something that was, uh, at least in the church, something that is a not necessarily a good thing. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, the primary person that you might uh, find associated with this is St. Augustine. So how many of you have heard of Augustine? Okay. So Augustine is pretty much the theologian of the West. Uh, doctrine of grace, um, doctrines of hell, uh, doctrines of justification and righteousness, all these kinds of things. Some of the church's views on women, um, all that. You can really blame Augustine and feel pretty comfortable about it. Um, that is the kind of guy he is. He is a masterful thinker in that you can't walk away from his work. Even if you hate the guy after you hear what he said, you can't walk away from it without actually being impressed by how well he said that terrible thing he said. Um, but he saw curiosity as something that would diminish one's desire to remain in the church and as a Christian. Because curiosity, he has this line in his famous book called The City of God in which he says, um, curiosity is this thing that is sort of a temptation, and he brings up astronomers, uh, these terrible people that, can, that use their curiosity to learn more about the universe and to do things like predict eclipses, which he thinks is kind of a bad thing to do because it makes you prideful. What he does appreciate, however, is wonder. Wonder is when you look at the world and you don't really know what you're looking at, but you're in some sort of awe. For Augustine, and I'm going to knock this over eventually, 
for Augustine, this is one of those things where if you have wonder, you can stop at wonder. You don't have to, it'll be a mystery. You can just relish the divine, stay in wonder. You don't have to take the next step towards curiosity. And so Augustine's uh, view of curiosity really dominated the church for about 2,000 years, leading to Thomas Aquinas. How many of you have heard of Thomas How many ex-Catholics are in the room? <laughs> That's usually why. Um, but by the time you start to reach a point of the Enlightenment, you have um, sort of this range of definitions being applied to wonder and curiosity. Wonder is the thing you start with. You look outside. How many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? Okay. So you know that feeling when you first approach it, the first time you see it, and there's this chasm that's two miles down, and you think, I think that's what it is. Well, at least at one point, it's like, this is, if you fall, you're really not going to survive. And it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing uh, place. You enter in this sort of like awe at, at what you're looking at. That awe, that thing that makes you stop and pause and not move forward initially, that is wonder. But now you want to know what's there. You want to understand it better. You want to figure out what it's made of. You want to understand um, how close you can get without you know, maybe feeling like you're going to fall in. Um, when I was a kid, we went there with my parents. And I had a, a camera. Uh, this, this is before digital. And um, so I was saving my shots for the best moments I could get. And there's this guy, I don't know, I was very little. So he might have been my age for all I know. He looked like an old man. And um, he was walking away from the bars, through the bars, out to a very small like precipice. I stood there with my camera just waiting for the moment he fell, because that was going to be the best picture I could possibly ever get. Um, tragic, too, but it would probably make the papers. So um, <laughs> the thing about wonder is wonder stops you, but curiosity draws you in. Curiosity drew him right to the very edge. And he didn't care how high up he was and how perilous it could be. He walked out there because he wanted to know more. And so curiosity is that inherent drive of ours to move beyond the wonder and to try to explain the universe, to try to explain the world around us. And in fact, it is something that the brain rewards. So there was a study in 2014 by California University scientists that uh, studied curiosity as a learning tool. What they wanted to know is, if you piqued curiosity, how much retention might there be? How much uh, you know, could somebody learn if it's paired with something that is you know, innately curious? They started with their participants. They asked them about things. And they said, well, you know, how, here's a bunch of questions. How curious are you? Rate how curious you are about learning the answer to this question. And they would see in a sort of a rating system how curious they were. And then they would um, you know, test them in an fMRI to see what their brains were doing. As they were more curious about something, there were the reward center of the brain lit up. That's that place where you get that great dopamine hit that makes it hard for you to quit drugs and a bunch of other things. Um, but also the hippocampus, which is where you, know, you might have talked about memory retention, that kind of thing, where you're, where you're dealing with learning to, you know, to remember things where memories are, are recalled. So what they found was that the more curious somebody was, the more that was paired with, that particular question would be paired with these kind of triggers. In other words, the brain was rewarding this inherent curiosity. The brain was saying, hey, uh, this is a good thing. Here's a dopamine hit. Do it again. So then what they did with the study is they paired that stuff with, um, they paired those questions with opportunities to learn things that were less interesting, the more mundane things. And what they discovered was that if they paired the learning with the things that people rated as highly, you know, they're highly curious about, and they paired that with the mundane stuff, the mundane stuff had a longer retention. So in other words, even when you're not really interested, if, it's, if you're learning about something along with something that is, you, are, you are interested in, 
you're likely to remember the thing you're not as interested in. So curiosity, when I say it's an inherent human drive, what I mean by that is that it's a part of who we are. It's a part of who we are as a species. We didn't get to where we are today unless we were curious about the world. You know, it, the guy that, you know, the early human that's walking through the savanna, the African savanna, and um, really isn't curious about what's rustling in the bush behind him, his genes are not going to pass on. Um, so the person who's really interested in understanding the nature of prey and predators in the world around that's able to pick up on these kinds of patterns has a better chance of survival to begin with. And the brain, by rewarding you in that area, is enabling that sort of survival mechanism. So it is really an inherent part of who we are. It is something that allows us to grow, but it is also something that some have felt um, is contrary to religion. And part of that is because curiosity can be, uh, well, all of you, have, how many of you act, were in a faith and then left? Right. That's why curiosity is kind of a problem. If you're going to learn something, you might want to leave the group that you're in. And um, as a lot of churches that have closed have learned that you need people to fill those seats in order to keep the, 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 the power on. So it's not really good for, for, for a church. It's not good for community if you leave and then you end up with people who, you know, you have less funds to, you know, support the community. So there's a lot of reasons why a religious body might try to keep curiosity tied down. But in more recent years, you have some Christians who have started praising curiosity as, as a virtue, uh, an emotion that is virtuous for Christians because they have uh, a personal connection to the Holy Spirit and therefore they have a better chance of really understanding the world around them. So it's sort of a hijacking of what was really ended up became a, what really was a sort of uh, early Greek and then Enlightenment virtue uh, is curiosity. All right, now, curiosity um, can also ignite cognitive dissonance. So, you know, who's heard of cognitive dissonance? Okay. Um, it, uh, when you have a perception of the world around you and the facts contradict that perception, and you have these two things that, that show the sort of tension between what you believe to be true and what the facts are telling you, you can enter into a form of cognitive dissonance. This is also true if you, do, if you engage in behavior that is contrary to what you believe is right. Um, so I imagine there are a lot of politicians that are <laughs> engaging in cognitive dissonance. Um, but that tension then can't be, it can't go on forever you are introduced to something that sort of basically just causes this uneasiness within you, you have to resolve that. You have to reduce cognitive dissonance. So there are ways to do that. One, you can be in a community, and um, that community can be, communities are very good at um, reinforcing views that you've already had to pull you back in. So uh, the evangelical world I was in, would say it's okay to doubt, it's just never okay to conclude that your faith is not right. Um, so they would say it's okay to doubt, but it's the job of the church to bring people, step to, you know, to help them step away from that edge of doubt and back into uh, a good solid theology that allowed them to, um, to not have that doubt. So a community can do that. When you have a community around you, that community can reinforce ideas that you have can reinforce this idea of being in an in-group versus being in an out-group. So um, if you, ha have you ever been uh, like the only atheist at a family Thanksgiving or any other holiday dinner? Okay. Um, you know the out-group feeling sometimes then. That idea that you don't belong within a group because the group has its own code, its own system, everybody follows that. Your dissonance might be helped in terms of reduction by trying to make this, by, by these groups helping you make decisions that reinforce your previous views. And part of this comes from confirmation bias. So have you heard of confirmation bias? Right. 
Um, the tendency to find information that confirms your beliefs, looking for only the information that confirms your beliefs. And the opposite of this is disconfirmation, the s exclusion of information that would, uh, uh, intentional exclusion of information that could actually contradict your beliefs. And so there was a, um, a study done, uh, uh, it was uh, done in, actually done in 2004, published in 2006, of uh, basically of, of, of the uh, uh, presidential election in, tw in 2004. Republicans and Democrats were given position statements, um, and they were asked you know, to, to look at those. And, and, and it, what they discovered is when, when a statement was contradicted, the candidate of choice for them, whether it's Republican or Democrat, they would gravitate towards these other statements that allowed them to sort of like have a reason for why this statement that makes their candidate look bad isn't saying what it is. So if you're, um, you know, uh, if, if your particular candidate uh, was, say, endorsed by a racist organization that wears white hoods, um, uh, and then he says, I, I, don't know, I don't know anything about this organization. I don't, you know, I haven't really, I don't really know anything about them. Uh, I can't make a judgment about somebody I don't know, despite the fact that his father used to wear one of those white hoods. Um, and then he has to sort of distance himself from that, and, and he goes on and does this thing. You might find people on Facebook saying, well, so-and-so said that he, when he was in that interview, he didn't have a good microphone. And so the, they'll latch on to, or he didn't have a good headset, or something like that. You might see it you know, in your feed on Facebook. And latch on to that bit of information to maintain their commitment to their candidate of choice. This particular study did very similar things uh, with Bush and Kerry. What they discovered is that when the person would read something about their candidate and that contradicted their view of the candidate that they love, but then they read another statement that helped them resolve that contradiction of evidence, they also got a hit in the reward center of the brain. They were given a dopamine hit. So curiosity is rewarded. Curiosity is there to challenge your views. Curiosity is there to make you look at the world differently. But curiosity is um, up against another thing that's sort of the anti-curiosity, which is confirmation bias. The thing that keeps curiosity from helping you change your ideas, and that is, uh, with confirmation bias, you're getting a, also a reward for your actions, for, for not changing your mind. So curiosity wants you to change your mind, to learn something new. It, it, there's a reward for it, but so does confirmation bias, which doesn't want you to change your mind. So that back and forth, there is in the brain a sort of back and forth as to why some people struggle with the evidence and why curiosity can be a player in that, but also how there's sort of this we're more comfortable when we stay where we, where we belong. But there's also called something called bias disruption. So it is possible to disrupt um, cognitive I mean, confirmation bias. Uh, a study done at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign looked at polarizing liberal and conservative participants and asked them about controversial ideas like capital punishment. They asked them to read counter perspectives, and, in a re and, and they put it in a very easy to read font. So it was like pleasant on the eyes, that kind of stuff. Uh, so they'd, they have their perspective, they had to read something that was counter to it. They read it in this easy to read font, and then they read it in a difficult font. If they read it in the easy read font, they felt like they could be, no, I don't agree with this. They just, they didn't have to stop really and think about it, it was easy to read, da 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 da. When they were given what they called a disfluent font, a hard to read font, it forced them to actually read the counter argument to their position slower, to break it up. So they had to actually read it and think about it. And they found that their positions on issues mo became more moderate instead of either highly liberal or highly conservative. So there is a way to stop someone if you enter, interject enough moments of pause and thinking in someone's uh, mom, you know, in a moment of their life, you can get them to actually have to rethink about something, to actually not just dismiss it, not just embrace the confirmation bias. You can actually bring enough evidence to bear on something 
that they have to stop and think about. Or there could be enough things that happen in someone's life where somebody may have a very elaborate and sort of like pious view of the church and just how good the church is. And then for a series of years, they can have very bad things done to them, sometimes by the very priests that oversee them. And, and if it happens enough, they, they might finally start to just analyze what they're seeing in life differently, much the way somebody might have to stop and read this uh, statement, counter statement, and think about it differently because there's enough disruption going on to get them to question things. So if you know someone, I knew someone once that had never left Toledo, and she lived in Temperance, and she almost never went into Toledo, and Temperance is like a few blocks of worth of Toledo. It's not really big. And then she uh, came with my parents once when I was, doing, I was in school in Chicago. And she came to visit. And she had never seen a city like that. It was a major disruption. She was walking around to every little kid she saw. Where's your mom? And, you know, and, and, and she was wanting to help every homeless person. It was, it was adorable. Um, but it was also Chicago. So we had to sort of explain things to her. But it was so much at once that she, it wasn't just like she saw it on TV and then she was able to just sort of think about it and then move on. She was, in, she was it was a disruption for her thinking. And I, th I think that with enough disruption through education, life experience uh, that causes us to stop and re-examine life, that can allow curi curiosity to overwhelm confirmation bias. So what disrupted my faith bias? Uh, and that's what I've been trying to uh, find out for myself. Um, see if you want to do a Marco Rubio. Ah, there we go. Um, so life in the church. I was a pastor's kid. Um, there are high expectations of a pastor's kid. Number one, you're going to be a theologian. You're going to know everything there is to know about your Bible. And I actually loved it when I was a kid. So that was not a big deal. Um, I did not have a lot of friends. <clears throat> um, but that was okay. I had a lot of church friends. That was one thing, just never outside of that group much. Uh, I was sort of, also, as part of a, being a pastor's kid, you're baptized into the gladiatorial world of Christians eating Christians. Uh, um, I, in my book, uh, Consider No Evil, uh, Two Faith Traditions and the Problem of, of Academic Freedom and Religious Higher Education, which came out the year that I left uh, my job, um, I look at you know, a bunch of things that happen like this, and I talk about my personal story in the church, and one of those things involves how many times the church I grew up in was split in half over disputes about who had the right theological idea. In uh, two major cases, it was actual family uh, that caused the split because the church at the time was sort of like the family business. Uh, everyone in my family was in leadership at some point, so it's sort of just a something waiting to happen. So I watched people that claimed to be good Christians that did this, and I watched them sort of eat each other up. Uh, that eventually, as I saw that happen, not only in the church I grew up in, but in the academic world where I watched um, professors, lose, my colleagues lose their jobs over things like believing in evolution. Uh, if you're a Christian professor and you say that the ARC exhibit <laughs> Uh, that, that's coming out here is um, based on a, an ancient Mesopotamian myth that happens to be a lot older, older coming out of Bab Babylon. Um, then that person is likely, if you're in a conservative evangelical school, likely to lose uh, his or her job. Um, and if you're in a conservative evangelical school, it's likely to be a him, not a her. So um, you have this sort of moment where you start to see this happening in, when you're growing up in church, but you see it in the academic world as well, where faculty are just literally, they're, one moment they're, they're supposed to be worshiping together with other Christians in chapel, and everybody is singing and praising God, and they're happy, and then they go to the faculty senate, faculty meeting, and um, they vote on how to get rid of somebody <laughs> And, and strip their family of life insurance and a, a paycheck, these kinds of things. So uh, from a young age, I was baptized into this sort of world, and I saw it as I went through my schooling. New information meant constant theological uh, invent, reinvention as well. So uh, I was a very curious little theologian. Over the years, 
whenever something new came to mind uh, that, that, was, um, that brought me into this cognitive dissonance, uh, confirmation bias became helpful. Now, confirmation bias does not have to result in you just going back to the thing you always used to believe. It can result in sort of a dialectic a synthesis. So you have this idea, this contradictory idea, and you come up with a third thing that makes the best of everything that allows you to sort of keep your like, act and mental integrity because you're not believing something that no longer makes sense while also remaining in your faith. And I was really good at this, really, really good at this. Um, I'll talk about when I finally decided not to do that. But it led to a lot of changes over time. Um, new information meant theological reinvention. And when you're in certain denominations, some ideas are not uh, welcome in any way. And you might end up having um, to think about moving on. And uh, we did this, changed lots of denominations. I was the first, when I was four, was a Free Methodist Church. but. I went to a couple shades of, you know, 50 shades of Baptist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian before I eventually landed in secular humanism. Now, to be honest, I could have stayed, I could have been a secular humanist and pretty much stayed in the Episcopal Church and nobody <laughs> would have thought differently. Um, I just wouldn't have been able to tolerate it. But um, I went through all these different changes over time. All these were one theological reinvention after another. How many times can you do that? before you end up saying, hmm, that's it, I'm done. And where are you going to be in life when you've been a pastor's kid? You've been to three evangelical institutions. You have a PhD in the history of Christianity. You're teaching that at a seminary. That's your paycheck. And when you reach that point while you're in the middle of your paycheck, or you're, well, this is your job, and uh, are you able to just walk away from it? Not everybody. You have to, you know, uh, you know the clergy project? Yeah, so I'm a member of the clergy project. Um, and uh, that project is for people just like that, where your job is something you can't do, but you can't leave because, you know, your kids, for whatever reason, have to eat and don't like to be rained on, so they have to have a roof, these kinds of things. So eventually I had to reach that position. So that back just a little bit before the, you know, before the professor thing. I was a student, three evangelical institutions. I discovered a lot of things as I went along. Probably many of you have discovered these things too. Uh, so I would do this thing when I was in class. I would teach the Bible's literature, and I would talk about uh, the canonization of scripture. And they would, my students, I would, by the time I get done, their jaws have dropped significantly. And this is, this is not something that even seminary professors hide. I mean, you can't. It's just, it's the idea that it took hundreds of years before the Bible becomes the Bible. You know, even after, and we're talking like a long time in the making, and even after the books are written, deciding which ones are the official canonized texts is a process. And um, it was always a little discouraging for them, I think, if, to discover things like that. Like, they, I would ask the question, how many of you thought that your Bibles came down from heaven like sort of a Monty Python moment with the clouds part, a big hand comes down, and it's got, you know, it's a Bible with gilded edges. It says Holy Bible on it. Maybe it has your name. It says Zondervan on the side. Um, how many of you thought that that's how the Bible came to you? you know, and I would actually, I would get every time, I would get hands that came up and said, well, basically, that's kind of how it felt. And they were surprised by this. So, so there's that. But then also you discover how uh, Mosaic Law Code is connected to the Code of Hammurabi. You discover things like, the flood and how that is connected to previous flood accounts, which are older by any estimation, conservative or liberal. Um, and you find out um, how these things affect views like you think that the Bible is inerrant. Moses is telling you that he's getting this law from God directly, but it's clearly cribbed from somebody else's law book. So if you was a student of mine, I would definitely flunk that paper for plagiarism. So, I, and I've had to, I've had students, have, I had a student once who turned in a paper. I've had this happen on more than one occasion, so I'm, nobody's going to be able to figure out who this is. But a student who turned in a paper, um, and I say that because I know I'm being recorded, um, uh, and this particular student's paper 
started off with an argument in the first page and a half, all of a sudden started arguing something the exact opposite of the first page and a half. And on top of that, the rest of the paper included sections where the font was different, the color was different, there's links involved. <laughs> um, and I just, I remember sitting there, I'm thinking, what the hell is going on here? Because I'm really good at picking up plagiarism, but I thought nobody would do this. So I ended up having a conversation. It turned out it was just a really bad time. It was a, there was a breakdown involved. But my first comment to her was, I'm not sure what I'm more insulted by, that you plagiarized or that you thought I was stupid enough to fall for this. And if, and if you're going to plagiarize, at least do it well. You know, learn from it and try to do it at least well. Make it difficult for me to spot. That's what happens when we're dealing with the Bible. You, you start reading it. You start to see where there's been editing involved, where the editing has resulted in different numbers for different things, uh, how long the flood account you know, was, when the, when the ark door closed, these kinds of things. Uh, did it close on the first day? Did it close days later? This sort of thing. So um, all of that, when you start to read that, you could say, like, well, look at the first Genesis 1, that creation account. Genesis 2, that's just like zooming in on Genesis 1. But it isn't. Things were actually created in different orders in both of those. I mean, you literally have to not want to see what's there. Not like you're going to sit down and go, I don't want to see what's here, so I'm going to make up some other story. It's just that confirmation bias kicks in and resolves that cognitive dissonance for you. You don't see that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are different creation accounts. I was never really good at that part. I would try to come up with different things. I would try to invent new ways of dealing with these things. So as a student, I discovered how problematic the Bible was for itself, not only in terms of its science, but the ancient Near Eastern background, background in terms of its violent and socially unjust world. When Moses sends out his army to fight the Midianites, he sends them out. He tells them to kill everyone, men, women, children. They do the merciful thing, if you could call it that, and they bring back the women and the children after having slaughtered all the men. Moses, um, being the good Christian he was, because that's per, you know if you're raised in the evangelical world, he's a Christian, um, was upset. He was furious with his men. I told you to kill everyone. What are you doing sparing the women and the children? So what you're going to do is you're going to go kill the women that have already had you know, relations with a man, and you're going to kill the male children. Um, but you're not going to kill the, the virgins and the young girls. And he wasn't allowing them to keep the young girls so they can join the youth group. They were sex slaves. They were concubines. They were used to force marriage on, for, you know, to forcing them to marry, marry uh, younger men or to some, you know, old ancient Near Eastern pedophile. Um, it's a very socially unjust world. It's, there's no coincidence that women are listed in the Ten Commandments along with cattle and slaves as property because it's an ancient way of thinking. So when you're looking at this, you know, do not covet your neighbor's wife. In an evangelical you know, Christian bookstore, you walk in, there's a book on marriage. It says, the Bible says not to covet your neighbor's spouse. And it's the idea that you don't look out the window like David did and see Bathsheba and you lust after the him or her and then you go and you, you know, have an adultery. No, the covet isn't so that, uh, it's not like saying to the wife, don't covet after another man. She doesn't have that option. It's just a man not to cover after the, the neighbor's wife, donkey, ox, slaves because that involves um, taking another man's property says, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. And the only neighbor there is just a masculine neighbor. So when you're a student and you're reading these things, you can come up with ways of looking at this. You could try to find ways to deal with the Old Testament's justification of slavery. You could do these kinds of things. But sometimes it becomes overwhelming. And over enough of these moments, it even disrupts your ability to reason them away. Because if I post an article on Facebook about ISIS killing innocent women who stood against them and refused to be sex slaves, every one of my evangelical Christians would rightly 
condemn that. All, all the evangelical Christian friends I have would rightly condemn that. They would say, that's terrible. That is, that is an ungodly, terrible thing to happen. But ask them about Moses. And well, God, you know, Moses was God's man. And God would, you know, whatever God says you do, you have to do. Isn't that what ISIS is doing? Isn't that what they think they're doing? Yes, but it's a different religion. So you can justify it. You can reason it away. You can do things like I did, which is to say, God, uh, one, this is a very common way of doing it. It was very helpful. And I actually think it was a helpful point for me to, in, in life to come to this conclusion um, before I moved on because it allowed me a few, a few minutes to sort of think about things and not just rapidly move through a bunch of ideas and end up somewhere I didn't want to be uh, to you know, give some time to it. But it's called divine accommodationism. Have you ever heard of that? So it's the idea, and this has been around for a long time. Origin of Alexandria um, uh, said it. Um, uh, John Calvin said it. Um, the idea that God speaks baby talk. He uses baby talk when he talks to people. And uh, that means that when he wrote the Bible, he didn't use big, you know, discussion of Big Bang or evolution, that kind of stuff. Uh, he used mythology. He used symbolism. Uh, he wasn't creating a textbook or a science textbook or, or a history book of any kind. He just used whatever could accommodate the culture in the day. So when you read the Bible and you're looking for the first 11 chapters to be history, you're missing the point. God just spoke baby talk, babbling to these ancient humans because they didn't understand. He accommodated his language to their day and how they interacted with the world. So now you can do things like um, you can say things like, well, you know, Genesis one and two is a, is intended to actually be actually a sort of almost retelling of the e Exodus, which there's a there's a really good argument for it as a literary patchwork that that is intended for that. But it's not really intended to be a science textbook. Well, the first, the rest of the first eleven chapters, those are all based on mythology and not on history. Well, it's okay though because God was accommodating it to the language of the day. Well, yeah, there's probably no real Abraham, but the point is that God chooses His people, and Abraham represents that in the Bible. Well, it probably wasn't a Moses. We have no evidence for Moses, and there's really the common consensus among Old Testament scholars, biblical scholars, is that. Uh, there is actually no evidence for the Exodus. Um, and so um, you say, okay, there's no Exodus. So we just scratch anything really dealing with Moses for the most part. And then you start to, now, now there are some things that did happen that uh, people that did we did know ex do know existed that are in the Bible, but they're in a far later history. Um, and the evidence for them is still not great, but it's good enough to believe it. There's really not a lot for David, for example, King David. Um, so at some point, you start to get to the point of saying, I pretty much dismissed most of the Old Testament by saying God accommodated his language, he's not teaching history. Then you get to the New Testament, and you start to notice things like the book of Matthew is probably divided into five different sections to match the five books of Moses. Uh, Jesus is portrayed as a very mosaic person in, in Matthew. And in fact, um, He's giving his Sermon on the Mount on a mount. In Luke, it's on a plane. Why? Because Jesus is the new Moses. It's, so you start to see Matthew is literary, and you go, wait, is that, if it's, if it's really designed that way, does that make it history at all? And it, I mean, it makes better sense as to why Matthew has different things for, in different order from some of the other Gospels. At what point do you start changing all this before you go, that's it, I can't. I've changed all of it. I don't even recognize my faith anymore. I did it so I could stay in, but now I've done so much, I don't know if I can do anything but leave. So I went through this process of change as a student. My professors helped me by insisting on divine mystery, these kinds of things where you don't have to have all the answers. Or <laughs> two, there are two things I was told. You don't, have to you, know, you don't have to have all the answers. It's OK to rest in divine mystery. The other thing was, why do you have to have all the answers? <laughs> why can't you accept divine mystery? Um, so life as a professor. Well, guess what? You become a professor. By this point in my process, I'm an academic. I've been studying the ancient Near Eastern world. I've been studying the early Christian world. My, I've been studying the history of Christianity for 2,000 you know, years of it. I'm very good at it. I've published on it. 
um, I've learned a lot, a lot more than I should know if I want to stay a Christian. And I started attending things like the American Academy of Religion and start learning how to move from being a theologian to, which is a theologian is an advocate for a faith. Theologian might also be in religious studies, but it's, it's somebody who particularly advocates a theology. So if you're in a seminary, you're advocating for a particular theological position, a particular tradition. I moved from that to being a religious historian, which meant I was teaching more like a religious studies professor. I was starting to teach at the university next door to us um, and in the religious studies department. And uh, I started to become more of an academic. And the more of an academic I became, the less of an adherent to my faith I stayed. In other words, there's this great article by um, K.L. Knoll in um, the Chronicle of Higher Education in which he writes about what it means to be a religious studies person, what it means to study religious studies. It is, and he says this, the religious, um, the, the, the religious studies professor is to the theologian as the scientist is to the frog in the lab. And so when you're studying a theologian, you're studying theolo theology, you're studying history, you discover that when you can sort of, I don't think there's ever anything as, uh, such if neuroscience uh, has taught us anything, is that there's no such thing as pure object, uh, pure neutrality. But we can try to find a sort of semi-objective perspective, step back, try not to invest our own uh, wants into something and study it for what it is. And when you do that, um, is that right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and when you do that, um, you, you start to see things differently. Uh, it's like walking up to the Grand Canyon, seeing it in awe, then going and learning about it and reading about it and learning about the process of, uh, of, of how it came to be, which we all know is the flood. Um, so <laughs> in learning about that, and now you might not have the awe anymore. You still have something better um, because you can still be awed by other things, but now you understand it. When you study a theologian, you start to understand the theologian as a person and not as somebody who is infallible. The problem was for me, too, is that as I was learning all this stuff, I put myself under that microscope. I became that frog. I started finding my biases everywhere. I started looking at the cognitive dissonance I was experiencing and the confirmation bias. And I realized the reason I was experiencing that was because I was a pretty curious person who really wanted to go where the evidence led him. And so I allowed myself some time, um, but at one point I was, I was working on um, a theological response. It was partially historical and partially theological response to the problem of entropy. What would a theologian's response, uh, what could a theologian's response be to entropy? There's actually, there are actually theological problems with that, especially if you believe the universe is gonna go a certain direction. Um, and at one point I remember thinking, oh, I got this really interesting article, uh, idea in mind that deals with theology that pulls from some very great theologians uh, that involves uh, a, a philosophy of personal identity that, you know, and how t two things can be two different things but be the same thing at one time. And then I just, I remember at one point I set my stuff down and I looked at my computer and I thought, now I'm just making shit up. Then I thought, now I'm making shit up? Wasn't I doing it before? And so I typed uh, uh, on my computer, um, I'm either a deist, some form of agnostic, or an atheist. But I don't think I believe in God anymore. Because I was just suddenly, the frog was dissected, all the guts were out, and I realized what I was doing. I was not uh, coming to the conclusion that all this confirmation bias and this theological reinvention should have brought me to earlier, which is that I was creating the world I wanted, but not living in the world that I had. Um, so I allowed myself some time to be in cognitive, to, to, be, uh, to be in this sort of situation where I could just think about it and not rush into things. But I started writing publicly about my changing beliefs. Um, I limited what I said in class because I wanted to respect the community I was in. But I published, I pushed buttons by things I published on different places, Huffington Post and some other stuff, and my blog and all that, um, to the point where some donors 
threatened to not you know, give money, things like that, uh, that for some reason made the school a little nervous. Um, but I mean, in their, uh, uh, but I hadn't really talked about everything I had thought. Um, and in their defense, that would, should make them nervous. And they were, they were willing to, because they only knew some of what I was thinking, they were willing to support me. They're like, well, okay, you don't believe that there's an original Adam, you accept evolution. Like, okay, you know, we're fine with that. We can support that. Um, uh, very different from the usual stories you hear in the news. Um, but at the time, I had also been writing my book, Consider No Evil, tracing all of these different stories of faculty members, looking at the history of higher education and, 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 and the religious background of that, but tracing all these current stories, people I knew that were, that were in the news um, repeatedly, friends of mine that lost their jobs because they changed their views. They changed their views on simple things like uh, you know, marriage equality. Uh, yeah, can, a, um, can a woman be a pastor? Um, things like, um, are men and women equal, period? Things that you would think that by this time, you know, evolution, you would think by this time that would be less of an issue. So on single issues in many schools, these people were booted out, lost their jobs, lost their homes, lost everything they have. Some of them ended in divorce, that kind of stuff. And I thought, if I stay here knowing that I'm pretty much heading in the direction of just, I'm a secular humanist, I know, where, I know this is where I'm, I just need to accept this as the reality. Um, and so um, I resigned in 2014 because I knew that the dean would support me because he is a noble, noble guy. And without knowing all the other stuff that I was struggling with and the things I was, I was the direction I was heading, he would just, I would end up bringing, you know, torment on him over the next few years. So I resigned. I didn't want to disrupt the community. Uh, I didn't leave my job earlier because my entire life and career was entangled in my faith. And there's something about um, having a religious family, as I do, student loans, as I very much do, and probably forever have, and a paycheck that makes, li makes leaving, leaving a faith um, very difficult to do. And eventually you, you have to. Now, for me, what was different for me, I think, for, than from others, is that my wife, is a, my wife has a great career. She's a, a, a content strategist for a digital agency and stuff like that, and we're not and we weren't going to lose our home over it. Um, but, you know, some struggle with family and dignity, that kind of stuff, was not my paycheck, a different thing. But I made that decision to do that. And then I didn't talk about it publicly in terms of, like, all the details why for over a year. Um, I was trying to resolve some things with some family members to make sure they knew. But then I published an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education, um, Losing Faith in, higher ed in Religious Higher Education. Did anybody ever see that? Piece. Okay. That was quickly followed by an article in um, The Guardian um, on, uh, what, on the process of grieving the loss of faith and, and how that can affect someone. Um, so, uh, I mean, when I left, I've been a, I've been a freelancer for uh, like the Village News Service and stuff like the Washington Post and the Daily Beast and stuff like that. Um, trying to sort of, uh, some of it's based on my story, but some of it's just looking at the stories of other people. Um, but realizing that, that's, this is my story. In other words, I was, this, everything I've told you here only happened to me in that precise way. But it's not necessarily the case for everyone else. Some people have longer process to go through. Some of them are at the beginning of that process, and they can't see why I would be where I'm at at the end yet. Some people, um, will never, they will be born into a Christian family, they'll live a Christian life, and they'll die that way. And they're never going to see those points. So uh, in my own process, I think learning about how long it took me to do this and how, long, and how much of a struggle it was for me, how uh, the more curious I was, the more things unraveled. And the more curious I was, the more my brain rewarded that curiosity, eventually to the point where that curiosity was like a horde, an army that overtook the confirmation bias which didn't have enough of a surplus to, of soldiers to resist that, to the point where I eventually left my faith. That's me. And in doing that, um, I've learned to, uh, that, 
this is a very human thing to do that, to struggle with, with your identity in this way. And so for some people, it just takes longer. And for me, this is how long it took. And so in, in doing this, um, I had to leave seminaries or schools for training ministry, so obviously I couldn't stay. And I talked about the theological, but I, know, you know, I was now part of the 22% of Americans who are religiously unaffiliated, and some of those are um, secular humanists. And I wanted to do right by the community. And I can tell you that uh, right now I'm working on a, uh, an article for the Daily Beast for um, the weekend that will look at uh, lives of people who left their faith and um, you know the sort of cost, divorce, children shunning, community shunning, that kind of stuff, and, and, and how they felt after making that decision to leave their faith and to engage in that. I didn't have to do, uh, so far, nobody's disowned me. Uh, and in fact, my father has said to me, I trained you to, I wanted you to be a the theologian, but I also wanted you to think for yourself. So I guess I can't be upset that you thought for yourself because that's what I really wanted you to do. Um, so I didn't have that experience that some people have where you know, I could have you know, to say, hey, my family disowned me. But these are all things that, things that I went through, that confirmation bias and dissonance and all that, community trying to keep you, you know, uh, in the center. Those are all things people, people go through. I left my faculty position and I look at curiosity and I see that as a, pr as a very big thing. Some people leave their religion because of how they're treated. Others leave because they were just never really into it to begin with. Um, but uh, I think it's helpful that if you've left the faith to write your own narrative, to understand why you are the way you are today and why you left, because that'll be at the very least help you to understand the family or friends that you have that never did that. Um, and maybe even eventually down the road lead to good conversation that eventually helps them out on that path. Uh, if you want to find me uh, at, at the beginning of this, at D. Withrow at Twitter. Um, and I have a blog, which I have not blogged at for the last month because I've been working on a book. Um, but I will be back to you this, this month. So uh, you can find me there as well. Um, I think that's it. Thanks. Yes, I understand that my whole life is just a blink of an eye. The history of the earth is with each moment that goes by. But this moment that I live in you, it feels like